Hi, I'm Dr. Sophie Renner, and I'm a lecturer in the University of Glasgow School of Physics and Astronomy. We're here in the university's observatory, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about neutrinos, which is something that you learn about in the astronomy course here. I'm going to start with a very basic question, which is why does the sun shine? This is a question that humanity has been asking since as long as we've been asking questions about the world around us. And it's amazing that it's only in the last century or so that we've actually found the answer to that. And the answer is that inside the core of the sun and all stars, nuclear fusion reactions are happening. The temperature is so high and the pressures are so great that nuclei of hydrogen atoms can fuse together to form nuclei of helium atoms. And this process releases energy, which powers the star and reaches us here on Earth as light and warmth from our sun. But energy isn't the only byproduct of this nuclear fusion reaction. Tiny particles called neutrinos are also produced. Neutrinos, as the name suggests, are neutral and they barely interact at all with other matter. So while the energy that is produced in the center of stars takes a while to sort of filter out through the layers of the sun before it can reach the surface and be released as light, the neutrinos just leave the core immediately as soon as they're produced, traveling at almost the speed of light and travel out through space. So they're reaching the surface of the Earth all the time and they're completely invisible to us. Solid rock is no barrier to them. So they just pass straight through the Earth and anything else in their way. In fact, 100 trillion neutrinos are passing through your body every second. So how do we know that they're there? With light from the stars and the sun, we can just see it with our eyes or with telescopes. But with neutrinos, it's a lot harder. We need them to interact in some way with our instruments, which only happens very, very, very rarely. In the 1960s, physicists were trying to work out how to detect these neutrinos that they knew must be coming from the sun. And in the Homestake mine in South Dakota, they built the first experiment that was capable of detecting these things. The experiment was a giant tank filled with perchloroethylene, which is a common dry cleaning fluid. And this fluid has atoms of chlorine in it. And the idea was that when a neutrino passed through the tank and it happened to interact, so this happens very rarely, but some of the neutrinos will interact, and hit a chlorine atom just right and produce a isotope of argon. And so every few months, the physicists extracted these handful of atoms of argon from the tank. And in this way, they could count the number of neutrinos that had interacted with their experiment. But when the physicists started counting these argon atoms, they found something weird. Even accounting for the tiny probability of a neutrino interacting with the experiment, they only counted about a third of the neutrino interactions that they were expecting. So this was very puzzling and immediately everyone assumed that either there was some mistake in the calculations of how many neutrinos the sun was producing or how many neutrinos this experiment was expected to detect, or alternatively, there was just something going wrong with the experiment but they continued taking data for years. This problem persisted and they did all the cross checks they could think of and it remained a puzzle. And it became known as the solar neutrino problem. But it turned out that this problem wasn't something wrong with the experiment. It was actually telling us something very fundamental about the nature of these neutrino particles themselves. It was already known that the electron had two heavier cousins called the muon and the tau. And these particles are exactly like the electron in every way, except that they're a bit heavier. And so it was thought that perhaps the same thing was true of neutrinos. Maybe there were three copies of neutrinos. And in these fusion reactions in the sun, only one type is getting produced, the so-called electron neutrino. And so only this type was being detected by the experiment in the Homestake mine. That was the only type it could detect. That was the only type anyone thought it needed to detect. But people started to wonder, maybe if, if these neutrinos were changing 
their form changing from one type to another on their journey from the sun to us. Maybe that could explain why some of them appeared to be going missing. So to test this theory, newer, bigger, more sensitive neutrino experiments were built. There was an experiment called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada. This was also in a mine and it was a huge tank of heavy water surrounded by nearly 10,000 very, very sensitive light detectors. So the idea was that if a neutrino, any type of neutrino this time, uh, passed through the detector and happened to interact, it would produce tiny flashes of light that could be picked up by these detectors. So this was the first time that an experiment was capable of detecting all different types of neutrinos. And when they counted the number of neutrinos that were arriving from the sun, now it matched with what was expected. So clearly, neutrinos are shapeshifters. They are changing from one type to another on their way from the sun to us. And this was something that was completely unexpected. And it actually showed us something about neutrinos, which is that they were always assumed to be massless, completely, completely massless, just like particles of light. But actually, in order for them to do this, to change from one type to another, they must have a small mass. This is something that is still unexplained by our current theory of particle physics. And it shows us just how much there is still to know about the tiniest constituents of our universe. But these neutrino experiments are also teaching us about astronomy. The fact that we can see these neutrinos coming from the sun means that we can now see the sun even at nighttime. So the Super K experiment is another huge neutrino experiment in Japan. And it consists of a giant tank of water surrounded by many, many very sensitive light detectors, which detect tiny flashes of light when the neutrinos happen to interact with the water in the tank. And they managed to take a photo of the sun at nighttime just by using the neutrinos that were passing through from the other side of the Earth. To detect neutrinos carrying even more momentum, even larger detectors are required. The ice cube experiment uses the ice of the South Pole as the experimental material. So deep under the ice, thousands of light detectors are distributed over a cubic kilometer of ice. So that any time a neutrino hits the ice, these light detectors will be able to see that neutrino and even determine the direction that it came from. IceCube isn't looking for neutrinos from the sun. It's actually looking for higher energy neutrinos from outside our solar system and even outside our galaxy. And this means that IceCube can explore regions of the sky that can't really be understood properly using only normal telescopes. A few years ago, IceCube discovered a new source of high energy neutrinos. It saw a neutrino that was coming from a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy about 4 billion light years away. And this new possibility of using neutrinos to explore the distant universe is likely to lead to even more exciting discoveries Thanks for watching, and if you found this interesting, the University of Glasgow has several physics and astronomy degrees that cover more of this exciting stuff. Mm -hmm.